Joining me now in the studio, Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald. And down the line, I'm joined by Scott Lucas, Professor of Inter International Politics at University College Dublin's Clifton Clinton Institute, and also by Colonel Richard Kemp, a retired British Army officer. I might start with you, Colonel, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, just to talk about the shooting down of the missiles and technically what it involves and the fact that, that, that we were involved in this country and, and that, that just to explain how you shoot down missiles before they even enter Israeli territory. Do you mind telling us? A very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. The, um, the, 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 the volume of missiles that was fired at Israel over the weekend was, was I think, the largest... Um, particularly in, in terms of the drones, which made up about 170 of the total number of projectiles, was the largest um, long-range drone strike ever in history. Um, but when you take all the projectiles together, around about 300 or more, um, it, it's a, a phen phenomenal task to knock them out, particularly before they get to the target territory. And it requires tracking. Um, sometimes you know you can you can identify a drone launch site, and you, you but you then have to track it, and then allocate each drone or each missile to um, an interceptor of some sort, whether it's an aircraft or uh, an anti uh, an air defence missile, both of which we used in this situation. Um, uh, and it was uh, I think the, the it was quite a phenomenal uh, act of coordination, given that not only the Israeli defence forces were involved, but also British, French and Arab countries took part in it. There have been exercises involving a number of different countries with Israel to uh, deal with this kind of scenario in the past. So there was preparation made for it. But it's a very complex job. And I think it was very impressive that so much, they, they were so effective that there was almost no damage done. Tragically, a young Arab girl was killed uh, was sorry was severely wounded and there was minor damage to a u.s air base but that was all out of such a huge effort from iran can you explain about how we played our part where geographically who is involved in it how do we do it and what do we contribute apart from uh, expertise and know-how do we contribute weaponry and and technology to this or is it manpower or how do we play our part well in this in this particular Case, we provided combat aircraft uh, flying out of Cyprus to um, down some of the projectiles that were fired at Israel. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised also if we didn't have early warning sensors deployed, which helped in this process that I mentioned of tracking. But it, it was a unique uh, event, I think, for the UK. I think it's the first time since the Suez campaign in 1956 when Britain has actually actively cooperation with the Israel Defence Force in military operations. And, and, and talk about the training involved for our forces to be able to contribute, as you say, so efficiently, so effectively, so dynamically, so quickly and in such an unprecedented way. How, how are British forces trained up to do that kind of thing? Well, obviously, it's a, it's, it's a highly skilled art to, to carry out detection of projectiles firing over thousands of miles. And it's uh, a highly skilled art as well to be able to operate the aircraft and the missiles that the aircraft fires. Uh, all of that is, you know, routine for British, uh, for the Royal Air Force, of mm. course. Um, but uh, I mentioned before that th there have been exercises to coordinate these activities, which will include pilots, they will include missile operators, they include uh, command centre uh, controllers. And these have taken place over a number of years involving the US, involving the French, involving um, the Israelis and Arab countries as well. So it's quite an extensive array of training that's needed to actually achieve the kind of effect that was achieved uh, at the weekend. Uh, and let me ask you, um, Colonel Gemp, about um, the advice being given to Israel, particularly by uh, our head of state and by, by, by heads of state all over Europe and beyond, which is, all right, OK, keep a calm head. As, as David Cameron, our foreign secretary, said, think now with the, the head, not just the heart. This has been an incredibly successful uh, um, you know, campaign of, of repelling the attack. But don't <coughs> don't don't initiate or instigate any reprisals that any further. Just carry on. 
do you think from your knowledge of the region, your knowledge of Israel, that Israel uh, and Netanyahu particularly are likely to take any notice? Well, I don't think Israel needs any advice about keeping a calm head. I think, you know, they've been facing um, multiple threats from Iran and its proxies in this region for a very long time. And they have responded to them with, I think, in, in most cases, with considerable skill uh, and, and measured, measured response. So they don't need advice on that. I, I think the advice that they should, as President Biden says, take this success as a win, in other words, take it on the chin and do not retaliate, I think that's a different uh, story altogether. I, I would be astonished if the IDF doesn't carry out retaliatory action against this, as every other country in the world would do. Uh, and I think they should take retaliatory action. You can't simply allow, even if there was relatively limited damage due to very impressive defences, you cannot allow another country to attack you with uh, hundreds of missiles and then do nothing about it. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, we go back, I think it's been a long time since Britain has been attacked, but go back to the Second World War when Britain was attacked with uh, V1, V2 rockets as well as bombers. We didn't sort of say, OK, we'll take that on the chin and see what happened. We retaliated with immense force. And I believe in this case, uh, the IDF should also retaliate, retaliate with immense force. They should do devastating damage to Iran's military capabilities. And it sounds terrible to say that, I know, and it sounds as if it's going to, you know, this is going to cause massive escalation. Mm. My estimation is that it's the least escalatory path, because if you don't do that, if you kind of re retaliate tit for tat, you then encourage another set of retaliation from Iran. Iran has to be taught the lesson that it cannot carry out an attack of this sort. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be deluded into thinking that this is a justifiable retaliation to the Israeli strike that took place on a uh, Iranian military headquarters, which some people have called a diplomatic um, facility, which was in, which involved generals who were there planning attacks against Israel, which were facilitating delivery of weapons, funding, direction to Lebanese Hezbollah uh, and, and also Iranian militias in uh, Syria itself to carry out attacks against Israel. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a, a kind of unjustified attack. It was an attack that had to happen, mm. and it was legitimate, lawful, and in Israeli self-defense. I mean, I, this, I'm going to obviously ask Professor Lucas and and and, and uh, um, my guest to 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 talk about what you've just said. But before I do, let me just ask you a final question. Obviously, for the for for the entirety of the weekend the words world war were uttered and re-uttered by people in their living rooms and by people on the television and the radio and by people in the press. And, you know, people felt legitimate reason to fear an eruption that would escalate and devolve, you know, throughout the Middle East and far beyond, and maybe even reach us, heaven forbid, here on these shores. Do you think that talk of, a, uh, of another world war is, is an exaggeration, is precipitous, is, is inaccurate, or do you think there is a, a possibility of that now? Well, it's, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's overblown, that, that idea. We've got a regional war in our hands now. We've got um, military action being taken against Israel from Lebanon, from Syria, from Iraq, from Yemen, from also Gaza, and now from Iran. And so there, there is a regional war. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I hope I'm not going to be proved wrong here, but I, I don't think we're going to see other major players like China or Russia getting involved in this conflict. Now, I think it's, it's highly unlikely for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and I don't believe any other Arab country is going to get involved, let's say, on the side of Iran. In fact, quite the opposite, as we saw at the weekend. Um, Jordan and possibly Saudi Arabia as well came to Israel's defence militarily. I know other Arab countries in the region have been directly assisting Israel in, the, in their war in Gaza. Uh, because these Arab countries fear Iran mm -hmm. and they fear Hamas just as much as Israel does. They're, these organizations are direct threats to Arab countries in the region. They may not say that, they may uh, have a different form of rhetoric when describing their, uh, um, their, their um, reaction to what's going on. But certainly as far as I, as far as I understand, 
uh, the vast majority of Arab countries were on Israel's side in this. They want to see Hamas destroyed and they want to see Iran vanquished as well. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you very much indeed. Let me bring Professor Scott Lucas into the conversation. So you've heard what the Colonel has to say. You've been quiet and listened charmingly and politely, Scott. But what are your thoughts on, on his observations, most particularly the one where he says Israel does need to retaliate and actually it would be de-escalatory if Israel did so, not inflammatory. Do you think that's true? As an analyst, Vanessa, I'm just going to start with the, the facts as we know them. The first is, is that and this may sound strange to your viewers, but Iran's primary purpose with these military strikes was not significant damage to Israel. And that I know that sounds strange given they fired more than 300 drones and missiles. Mm. But what Iran did is they telegraphed this attack in advance. They told neighboring states days beforehand they were going to do this. And of course, if the Americans didn't know already, then those neighboring states told the Americans uh, the Americans and the Israelis, therefore, knew this attack was coming. They knew the launch sites where they were coming from, which is why, as the colonel described, they could track the drones and the missiles, including with partners like Britain, France, and Jordan, as they tried to get into Israeli airspace. In addition, Iran fired at sparsely populated areas. They especially tried to hit an Israeli airbase uh, in the Negev Desert in the south of the country, one that suffered minor damage, as you mentioned because it was hit by five ballistic missiles. So because Iran telegraphed this, it, in a sense, enabled Israel and the allies to respond, so you didn't get a direct confrontation. Now, why would Iran do that? That's what sounds strange. Because what they wanted was a demonstration strike. They wanted to do two things without directly going after Israel at this point. The first is they wanted to show to their own people, oh, we can act tough, we, we aren't weak. That's in light of Israel's assassination of a series of Iranian commanders, and especially the assassination of the Iranian commanders on the Iranian embassy compound on April 1st. It is diplomatic territory, by the way. It was not a military headquarters. They crossed a line, in other words, with that with the Iranians. So Iran carries out the demonstration attack for a second reason, which is to tell the Israelis, if you keep on doing these assassinations, especially if you hit our diplomatic territory, again, we will respond, and next time we will target you. We won't just make a demonstration attack. Now, we can debate whether or not Iran should have done that, but it does mean that Iran is trying to contain this in a way, and now we ask if Israel is going to contain itself. And again, the fact is, is that what I think is off the tape, and I'd be very surprised if it happened, is a direct Israeli attack on Iranian positions inside Iran. That's because it's been vetoed in the past by Israel's military and intelligence services when Benjamin Netanyahu suggested it. And secondly, because Joe Biden made it very clear within hours of the Iranian attack in that phone call to Benjamin Netanyahu, the U.S. will not give support for such counterattack. That does not rule out Iran, or sorry, Israel hitting Iranians outside of Iran. So the questions for me are, does Israel continue to assassinate Iranian commanders inside Syria? Does it assassinate Hezbollah's commanders in Lebanon? Does it try to step up covert secret operations inside Iran, which is carried out for years and years, for example, to undermine Iran's nuclear program? So in other words, the, Iran the Israelis will retaliate, but they'll retaliate in such a way as to not try to make this a direct hot war with Iran throughout the Middle East. All right, let's listen to what Rishi Sunak has to say, then we'll get Alicia Fitzgerald's view on the political situation here. This is the Prime Minister earlier. Mr Speaker, with this attack, Iran has once again shown its true colours. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are intent on sowing chaos in their own backyard, on further destabilising the Middle East. Our aim is to support stability and security, because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail, and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Yes, let me bring our political correspondent, Lizzie Fitzgerald, in here. We'd like to see calmer heads prevail, but, of course, uh, Colonel Kemp just said, well, you know, we didn't say that in this country when we were attacked by the Germans. We didn't say, well, let's keep a calm head and do nothing. As he said, we retaliated with full force. So I don't know what you think about the political situation here vis-à-vis -vis what might go on in Israel.
Well, I think what Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer both said was that they acknowledged that what happened over the weekend with Iran's uh, missile attacks was unprecedented and totally wrong and dire. But I think where their advice came from in saying that Israel needs to keep a bit of a cool head uh, about this is the fact that we obviously heard a couple of weeks ago that, that Israel may have breached international law um, with their escalation in Gaza. So I think what they were saying there is very much, yes, you do have the right to kind of retaliate, but you can't kind of go in full force and expect nothing to happen from it and not expect this conflict not to spread and, and, and become larger. And I think what, what Richard was saying as well, with a comparison to Germany, obviously that was a huge scale conflict. So I think there's risk that by, you know, retaliating in a very strong way that this could massively expand that conflict um, in the Middle East and have really dire consequences. And in this country, we have uh, Keir Starmer and the Prime Minister pretty much united on this front. And in fact, all parties pretty much united, don't we? Very much so. And uh, it's always really rare, actually, to see Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak very much agree on something. Their statements earlier on this were almost identical. Um, the only slight difference was that Rishi Sunak um, was urging for a humanitarian pause still and Keir Starmer uses the word ceasefire. So, I mean, really not a huge amount of difference between the two. And both parties very much united on this cause, which can only be a good thing because you need as many people uh, behind something to actually have an impact. Lots of people questioning how much the UK can actually impact these conflicts. But it's definitely a very more powerful to have two leaders of, of the two main parties in the UK actually agree on what should happen here. Certainly. Scott Lucas, final question for you. Should Netanyahu defy President Biden and fail to keep a calm and cool head and instead do the opposite? What, what will happen then in terms of you know, Israel's position on the world stage and Israel's relationship with the United States? Well, I have to emphasize, Vanessa, it's not just a question of Netanyahu with respect. 12 years ago, when Netanyahu wanted to attack Iran directly, it was the Israeli establishment that kept him from doing so. And the same is true in 2024. We have two other members of the War Cabinet, the Defense Ministry, Yoke Gallant, uh, the former head of the military, Benny Gantz. We have other members of the Israeli military, the intelligence services, the diplomatic services, who I think will be advising against a direct strike on Iran. But if Netanyahu was to do that, um, and I heard what the colonel said, but let's have, make no mistake about it, Israel would isolate itself in the global community. Because the fact is, is what Iran's careful in doing is not crossing a red line at this point and hitting Israeli populated areas directly. They're almost goading the Israelis to say, are you going to do it? And if Netanyahu hit Iran directly, including populated areas, there are very few members of the international community, including the UK, and I think even the US, that would stand by Israel in that case. Whereas at the current moment, Israel has an ironclad guarantee, Joe Biden's words, to its defense against any future Iran attack.